as we all know, the oldest piece of advice that we, <coughs> we writers get is write what you know. Makes sense, write what you know. So every once in a while in my long freelance career, when I've uh, run out of things to write about, I'll get a fresh notebook and I'll sit back and make a list entitled, What Do I Know? Huh? And uh, I've done a lot in my life. I, I, I quit the post for good in 73 and uh, ran away to Colorado to take up the hippie life, which I'm still doing, and to write fiction. And I had a couple of novels published. Uh, for 25 years, I was a feature writer for uh, the big travel magazines, and they sent me just everywhere I'd ever want to go, New Guinea, Madagascar, the source of the Ganges, the, the length of the Euphrates, uh, to Iceland to find Leif Erikson's birthplace. Uh, but what do I know? What do I know? It's always a very short list. <laughs> But always, if I'm honest, I have to put down somewhere in the number two or the number three position, marijuana. Because if there's one thing I'm a world's expert at, it's the blessings of perspective-enhancing drugs. And so, this fond recollection, 40 years stoned a journalist's romance. Um, some of this is comedy, or it's meant to be. The longest chapter is about my only sibling, my uh, older brother Jerry, who was uh, kidnapped at random by a serial killer uh, in San Francisco and driven off through the night and eventually murdered. Uh, and how I befriended the guy on death row to find out how Jerry spent his final night. Uh, and he told me in great detail. Um, but the, the heart of the book the narrative thread is about my dear wife, Holly, and her 20 year struggle with the ravages, uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, of Parkinson's disease, and how uh, smoking pot has helped to ease her anxieties and her discomforts, and how it has been especially generous to me by granting me, uh, oh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of sweet clemencies and inspirations which have given me the pizzazz to go deep into extra innings with her. Uh, it's been a very difficult 20 years, of course, but, but also very rewarding and, and satisfying and fulfilling. And I can honestly say it's the best thing that ever happened to me for my development to focus on helping somebody else instead of just focusing on myself. So uh, anyway, uh, I think it's fair to say that I have pretty much cornered the stoned caregiver market. Very small, I, I, th I think I have gotten it. Mm -hmm. And the cover of this book is Holly and me 21 years ago on a uh, remote stretch of Costa Rica where we were sent, I was sent on assignment for a series of articles building a beach shack in paradise. And uh, Condé Nast Traveler sent down a photographer, and it was Annie Leibovitz. So, so, so Holly and I are probably the two least famous people she ever shot. <laughs> <laughs> but we had three days to play with her, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but what I like about the picture is it shows that there was, within months of this picture, Holly started having the tremors and the other indications of the disease which was change our life forever. And so this captures us at the very height of our earthly ambitions, and I like that. Uh, let me just read, I have a four page adaptation of the, the end of my tale here, and this is about Holly. And this doesn't have any meant, uh, reference to dope in it. Holly's caregiver, Regina, wakes her up from her nap at 5.30 and wheels her out to the couch she brings her a plate of fruit, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries. This is often Holly's liveliest, most responsive time of the day. She is well rested and she has always loved to eat. It's one of the few pleasures she has managed to hold on to. She will sit on the couch and pick up those berries one by one by one and feed herself patiently and contentedly throughout the evening news and beyond. She is extremely good at focusing on what's directly in front of her. Her awareness keeps narrowing to the bare essentials. She has little concept left of the past or future. 
She has realized her lifelong spiritual ambition, it seems, to live in the here and now. Congratulations, sweetheart. I come into the room and see her leaning intently over her fruit, and it touches me how this small offering is enough to brighten her countenance. Hi, honey, I call. Hi, Tom. Regina and I look at each other, startled to hear her speak up so loudly and clearly. I kiss her on the forehead, and she gives me that game girl smile, which can sometimes break my heart. She looks so fragile, but at the same time resolute, her inner holly struggling to burst through this withered shell. She points to her plate and says something. I lean closer to hear. I can't understand every word, but I think she's talking about the blueberries. She seems to be remarking that they look like beads. I try to clarify, like beads from a necklace? She nods. You're right, I cheerlead, or from a bracelet. It's good to hear her string together a sentence or two. Exactly like beads, I belabor. The conversation appears to have run its course. I start moving away to do something else. She has more to say. I, I lean down again. She asks with a childlike sense of trust in her voice, do you think they're safe to eat? Oh, OK, I, I see. She thinks they really are beads. I rest a hand on her bony shoulder. I'm sure they'll be fine, honey. She looks up at me, that game smile. She seems to believe me that it will be all right. Dying isn't part of her repertoire. It has no place in her self-image. I keep thinking that the next holiday season is going to be her last one, and she keeps proving me wrong. Now another New Year's has come and gone. She's in a wheelchair. Her feet are swollen from poor circulation. Her breathing is shallow and congested. Her digestive system is shot. She is shockingly skeletal, down below 80 pounds. Still, look at how diligently she attends to eating her meals like some like some Zen priestess, bowing her head, spooning each bite slowly and shakily, but relentlessly in the direction of her mouth, not letting me take over the spoon, not lifting her head, not losing her focus, no matter how long it takes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, until the practice is complete. When her son Scott visits us, he loves to call out at the end of every meal, Mom wins the clean plate award. <laughs> On a Friday night, we put Holly on her bedside commode in preparation for her 12-hour sleep. Plainly, she is distressed, but she can't manage to say what's wrong. Regina and I try to comfort her, and after a while, we get her up and into bed. We lie her carefully on her side to protect the bed sore on her tailbone. I, I see her slipping off towards sleep, so I tiptoe away, heading for the refuge of my room upstairs. A few seconds later, Regina calls, Holly's, Holly's asking for you. I return and kneel next to her bed, and she attempts to say something. Her voice is so faint and indistinct, and yet so insistent, as if this is something, this is something very important. She's frustrated that she can't make herself understood. I strain to pick up even a hint of the subject matter. Is she trying to say goodbye? I lean closer, my head against hers. What if these are the last words she ever utters? Will I always have to wonder what she said? I soothe her in case she needs my per <clears throat> permission. Honey, you are on a journey, and I want you to know that whatever happens with you, whatever, it will be all right for the rest of us. Whatever happens, we'll be OK. I have voiced this sentiment before, but maybe she needs to hear it now. Maybe I need to say it now. At last, she musters up the wherewithal to speak, to express what's on her mind, her fears, her regrets, her hopes, her gratitude. At this most tender moment in our unending time together, she whispers, we need more butter. <laughs> <laughs> I pat her on the shoulder. I'm going shopping in the morning, honey. She closes her eyes, reassured.